Hello and welcome back to week eight. Hope you enjoyed blowing up your boxes last week. We got lots to do, so let's get going. This week I'm going to do a quick overview of the spacing chart, and this will provide you with another approach to building your animations. Uh, when we're done with that, then we'll move on to our next principle, which will be staging. Okay, so for animators with a classical background, this will be a very familiar workflow. And for people that are new to the animation process, it provides you with a template to block out your motions. But before we get started, I think there are a few terms you should become familiar with. Okay, so key poses. These are your most important poses. They are the bare minimum that you need to tell your story. So if we use the bouncing ball example and pretend these are drawings, the bare minimum we need would be a ball drawing here and here. These would be our keys to show that the ball goes from here to here. It doesn't show anything about what's in the middle, but it does say that we go from here to here. Okay, so the next thing we need to add are our extremes. And extremes are the furthest points in the action, usually where there is a change in direction. They're also used for contact poses, like picking up a cup or when your heels hit the ground. So if you look at the bouncing ball, the next thing you would block in would be the extremes. You can see the ball goes down, up, down, up. Changes of direction. This is the furthest it can go in one direction, furthest it can go up, furthest it goes down. Next is our breakdowns, and these are the transitional poses between extremes. So once we show the breakdowns, we can see that these kind of show us our path between A and B. It's not linear, and it's not in a pendulum. We know that it's now bouncing. We can clearly see that. So the last thing we add are our in-betweens. And in-betweens are used to pace the animation. It's what we use to add our ease in and our ease out to all of our poses. So all this stuff looks great on a ball, but what does it look like on an actual animated character? Okay, so using the animation from last week, let's dissect this and get some more context for these terms. So key poses, this will be our first key pose. And this would have been our second key pose. These are the two poses that we need to tell our story. We know that he stands at the beginning and at the end he blasts. After the key poses would be the extremes, the changes in direction. We know from pose one that he leaned forward a bit and then he started to go back, which led to extreme two. Again, this is the change in the direction. This is the furthest that he goes. So after this comes the breakdowns, and this is the transitional pose between the extremes. So you can see where it was. He settles into his final extreme pose before he released the bolt. And here was the second breakdown where he was doing the crossover into the blasting pose. And then after that, we just had a whole bunch of in-betweens. And then when everything was done, and this is what it looks like when they all play together. So with those four terms in mind, let's head into Moto and take a peek at the spacing chart. So with the terms we just covered, let's pop open the spacing chart. So to find the spacing chart, it's right here. And right off the bat, you'll see some familiar terminology. So this tool's been demoed uh, by Brad Peebler and by Andy Brown before. I'm going to do it a little bit different because it suits the way I work better. Um, in their demos, they were dropping keys on every frame. Uh, to me, that feels cluttered and crunched in, so I'm going to do it where I do a little bit of spacing at the beginning just to give me some breathing room, and then I'll use the spacing tools on top of that later. But just for the initial blocking, I'm going to drop poses, and I think it'll help you understand the things in what order they come in. So I'm not going to sit here and pose this all out again. I've uh, grabbed the animation from last week and broken it down into various poses, and I'm just going to insert them to save you the agony of watching this get rekeyed for the next hour. So I've got an actor, load him up. I've got an action, I call it spacing. Okay, so with the spacing chart open, I'm going to add my key pose right here. Click on add key pose, it'll get grayed out to let you know you've added one, and it'll throw a little marker down on here. Now, because this is grayed out, now it's giving me the option. I can add an extreme, and if I move forward a couple frames, you can see this comes back on, and I can add another extreme. So this is kind of helping me structure what I need to do. Now I know that I had two key poses. We had the standing key pose, so I will set that. This was key pose one. Now I'm going to go to frame 10. I'm going to set another key pose. 
just add key pose here and I have key pose 2. I'll set that. So now we have a nice transition between the two. Now you notice the terminology down here will change. Right now it's insert key pose, insert extreme. If I scrub a little bit you can see now it's asking you to insert the breakdown. And the breakdowns were the transitional poses between our extremes. But we haven't set those up yet. So after the key poses we know we want to add our extremes. So frame zero, I'm going to hit insert extreme. And it'll drop it right in the middle of the two key poses. So I'm going to go over here and I will set that. Now this is one of the extremes where he changes direction. This is where he begins to move back. So after this one, I can add another extreme because we know from the demo that the next one where he goes back as far as he goes before he starts to come forward. So I'm going to start spacing this out just to give myself a little bit of breathing room. That's just how I like to do things. If you have the R here selected and you click this, depending on where you're selected in the timeline, you can do a ripple edit. So you can add frames and space things out or remove frames. So I'm going to block things out to five. So I'll add there and one, two, three, and push that there. So now everything's nice and spaced out. If I scrub through here, got my first extreme, second extreme, final key pose. Okay, so with our extremes added, next thing we need to add is, well, let's scrub the timeline and see. Oh, breakdowns. Breakdown, breakdown, breakdown. As we scrub through and as we, as we have these in place, spacing chart will kind of help us along with what we need to add next. So to add a breakdown, all I have to do is just swipe across here. You can see it's added a pose at frame three. Now rather than key this all out, I'm just going to go down here and I'm going to hit set and that has updated the pose. Now I know I have another breakdown over here and that was for this part right here. Remember in the bouncing ball example how our breakdowns showed that the ball was bouncing in an arc and not swinging in a pendulum or moving up and down in a vertical line. This breakdown is going to show us that his hand doesn't go out in a big circle, that his hand just glances his cheek as he pushes through. So I'm going to swipe here to add my breakdown and I'm going to go to break five and set that. And now you can see that pose makes a lot more sense. So if we scrub through here now, We've got a breakdown, extreme, extreme, breakdown, key pose. So now if I go back to frame zero and start to scrub, you'll see it's going to tell us what we need to add next, in-betweens. And if you scrub through here, you can see add in-between, add a hold, add ease, add a settle, add anticipation. And some of these should be starting to make more sense to you. Uh, for now, I'm just going to add an in-between. So if I swipe this, I'm going to get an in-between between this pose and this pose. I can go in and tweak this. Local. Say I wanted to just push this a little bit more and then put his arm up. Because auto key is on, it's going to update this as we move the model. So now it's going to go into the in-between edges set and then on and then onward. So next I could probably use another in-between in here to kind of explain what's happening between these two poses. So go to frame 8, I'm going to swipe through and I'm going to adjust this pose. Well, let's say I want him to stand up a bit, tip back a bit. And now this pose will be updated right here. So now he's not just going from here to here, we have an in-between. 
Now one of the cooler features inside the spacing chart is the ability to favor poses to one or another. So with that in between I just added, if I click here and drag, you'll see that pose is sliding closer to frame 6 or closer to frame 11. It was initially dropped right in the middle. So if we pop up the graph here to see what's going on, if I select pose the breakdown, frame 9, and drag it, you can see what's happened to the curves. So in the middle, the curves are just kind of mellow. They just kind of flow through. But just remember, the steeper the curves, the faster the motion. So as I increase this, you'll see the smaller gap in here makes a shallower curves over here, which means he's going to race into this pose and then slowly go into that one. So if you scrub the timeline, he's quickly going back and then settling into this one. So let's adjust our primary breakdown that we put at frame 14. So if I click on here and drag, you can see our curves. If I push it all the way back, nothing's going to happen. He's going to sit here, barely move at all, then race into the other one. Well, that's no good. So we'll click here, drag this out. So we'll have him ramp up, because we do want him to race into this last part. So he'll just slowly, and then boom. I'm going to add another in-between right here, frame 15. I'm going to swipe through there. And I'm going to want to push that back a bit. And maybe just tweak, pull this in just a bit more. So you can see how the spacing chart starts with the broad strokes as well, and then with every pass, starts to hone in on the smaller and smaller motions until you're finished. So I've just added this in here. I can slide this pose that I just added. That's good. Fix that curve a bit. So here we go. Okay, so you can continue to tweak this by getting in here, adding breakdowns in betweens all these other options you have in here to add. I encourage you to go in here and uh, fiddle around and mess with it, see how you like it. Yeah, just keep layering stuff on until you think you've reached the end. So if the spacing chart is something you feel you could get more into, uh, don't forget there are two in-depth videos that have already been made and I recommend you check them out. Brad Peepler did one after the 801 launch and you can find that on Moto TV. It's called uh, Moto 801 Ace Demo. And Andy Brown also made one that comes with the 801 Spotlight series. So any 801 owners, you've got access to it. Go take a peek. Okay, so before we move on, I just want to remind you that if you're into this whole animation thing, that you should definitely pick up a copy of Animator Survival Kit and Illusion of Life. Uh, Illusion of Life is pretty pricey, but it's definitely worth it. So go get it. Okay, so say you like the favoring functionality inside the spacing chart, but you don't really feel like working inside that interface, dropping the poses that way. But you still want to be able to select keys and drag to the right and left to affect the favoring between poses. Um, that functionality has been kind of broken out from the spacing chart, and it's called the in-between tool. So if you click on this, see in-between tool will come active in the viewport here. Turn off and on. And now you can basically drop in-betweens wherever you want them. So I just have this animation here, just this little karate kick action. So if you right-click, just drag to where you want to put your in-between. If you right-click in the viewport, you'll see that I've keyed everything. And if I drag from the left to the right, I'm doing the same thing that we were doing in the graph before, inside the spacing chart where I'm favoring poses. So it's a little abstract to see it here. So we'll pop open our graph, and you can see between 
frames 20 and 30. I've added a pose on my entire actor because that was selected. And now if I right click and drag in the viewport, I'm favoring the pose. So here, this is dragged all the way, so it's favoring frame 20 completely. So there's nothing, and then boom, five frames snaps into it. If I go to frame 25 and right click and drag, I'll start doing it again. So I'm adjusting the entire pose timing really easily. So I'm just going to put a little bit of that ease coming out of 25. It's going to start slow and then snap into the end of it. So it'll go bang. Okay, so this middle pose is pretty weak because it's basically just an average of frame 20 and 30. It's just something in the middle, but it doesn't have much punch to it. So because everything's already been keyed, we can go in and adjust this in between just by kind of just grabbing our curves, pushing them around. His foot would probably be pointing down. You can pull him a bit more over. And lift this up a little bit higher. Arm out. So that one looks a little bit better. And we can key that, just make sure we got everything. So that's a lot stronger mid pose there. Should probably push this one up because the it's starting to gimbal on itself once it passes this point. There we go. Cha! Okay, so let's add another in between up here. It'd be nicer to hold put a bit more snap in this. This is still pretty kind of reserved. So in between, in between tool is still active. Middle click in the viewport. We just added a key. We can favor this. So I want it closer to, I want it to race to the end, right? So the end of the kick has more punch. So if we, oh, don't right click in there, right click in the viewport. So now you see he's gonna come up into this pose, kind of kind of coast for just a few frames and then cha into the last three. There we go. And again, we can go in, we could start manually adjusting this, putting a little bit more oomph into it. Okay, so I'm just gonna tweak those two. There's like a, there's a bit of a hiccup. We could find that, there it is where he's going in Y. So we can, cause he's, going up then he tapers off and he slows down so we could fix that and there's also one looks like on x so if you middle click you can push up tweak that uh, looks like there's one in z too Cha! okay so we can go back here just for giggles we'll key our actor here and we'll go to frame 20 push down we can add a little bit of anticipation here just nothing crazy so now we'll go down then into the kick okay so I don't like how his hips and everything are kind of taken off the ground at the same time here so again we'll go to in here let's add another in between middle click right click and drag I'm going to get him to kind of stick to the ground a little bit longer before he whips off. So, cha. So there you go. There's the in-between tool. Really nice way to throw down your in-betweens and do some favoring. As you can see here, I just I threw in a couple in-betweens, no big deal, and adjusting the weighting kind of on the fly. Uh, give it a whirl. I think you'll like it. Okay, so back to the principles. So far we've covered squash and stretch, anticipation, uh, follow through and overlapping action pose to pose straight ahead and today we're going to cover staging. Staging is a presentation of an idea so that it's clear to the viewer. Staging should lead the viewer's eyes to the parts of the animation that you want them to look at. 
This can be achieved through a combination of posing, camera composition, and lighting. Okay, so you've got your new scene, and the whole purpose of staging is to clearly communicate what your scene is about. Take a look at this guy. What's this scene about? It's nothing. He's got nothing going on. But if we go to this pose, this pose has a very definite vibe to it. And without knowing anything, with no set, with no camera, we kind of get a feel for Mr. Confident over here. If we go to this pose, without knowing anything about the story, as soon as we open our eyes and look at this, there's, there's problems. This guy's under duress. So Mr. Cheesy here, he's got a very uh, definite kind of angle. We can kind of figure out what his story's about. Here we have a uh, pouting child that knows everything. Here we have exhausted from running upstairs or just exhausted because they ran for the train and missed it. Um, dejected, sad guy. This guy's Mr. Action, ready to defuse a bomb or do something awesome. And this is Mr. Sad. He's just unsure of himself and uncertain. So if you scrub our timeline here, you can see we've got a whole bunch of different personalities going on. When you're planning out your camera angles, you kind of want your camera to help sell the emotion of your scene. That's part of the staging. So let's switch to a camera. We'll go widescreen here. Okay, so for this guy, Mr. Confident, what would make a good camera angle for him if you're doing this shot? I'm thinking something super low, very epic, maybe a little off-center, but that to me feels good. This composition and that pose, they work good together. What about Mr. Crazy Pants? Uh, maybe for him, you know, you have, you start wide and you punch in to kind of have a camera move that reflects the emotion of the scene. Things are going crazy. Everything's going. He's watching his car explode. And then you just do a crash, zoom into his face, just like kaboom. <sighs> Something like that. Mr. Cheesy. I mean, depending on what kind of character he is, I mean, seems a little cheesy, a little, little overconfident. I don't know. He might want to invade your personal space a little bit. A little pointing right in your face. Maybe a shot like that. Hey now. Annoying kid would probably just look up at you from this angle and tell you how you're wrong. Dejected guy who missed the bus or is exhausted from running somewhere. I don't know. You could put him... You could just make him look more exhausted and alone and sad. Just really wide shot. You could get underneath him and just have his whole face just hacking and wheezing. You could be uncomfortably close to him to match how uncomfortable he is. <laughs> uh, Mr. Action. I don't say he's about to jump off a rooftop. Again, that would be a good one of these. As he's about to jump, the camera just, whoop, poosh, you know, slams into there. So that would work. And uh, Mr. Emo Pants, I don't know. Maybe something off-center so it doesn't feel balanced, so he feels a little you know, off-kilter. Make them really small in frame. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just, they're just suggestions based on like the mood of the scene and the character. I mean, I think this, this framing with this pose is less effective than like even like that. That framing, they just look sadder and more alone. And there's just this big negative space just eating them up. Okay, so now I'm going to scrub through a few sequences that I've done over the years and just kind of talk over them and explain some of the decisions I made and why I staged the shots the way I did. Okay, so here's one I did last year. And uh, sorry, i got to keep using the same clips, but they're the only ones that I have all the rights to. So sorry about that. Uh, just give this first part a listen. There was a a moto user who finds our antics to be somewhat disconcerting. 
Oh, really? Yes. They... So I think in the interest of saving our show, David. We need to. We need to bring it down. <clears throat> and so, this and... week on Modcast. Okay, so the whole premise of this episode was that things were too crazy before and that now everything's got to be toned down. So that's why this camera is locked off with no motion at all for the entire shot. There's no cuts. There's no over the shoulders. There's no, there's nothing. It's the most boring, stagnant camera shot possible to match what has to happen in the scene, and that is to tone everything down. Now, if you watch the characters, you never want to have two characters doing a bunch of business at the same time, unless that's the staging you're going for of, of confusion. There's a lot of stuff, chaos going on in the scene. But for this, it's a give and take between these two characters. So he speaks, he listens, he reacts, he speaks, and you watch it's back and forth. When one character's speaking, the other character is barely doing anything at all. Just a couple blinks to kind of stay alive, but they don't compete for attention. And at the end of this monologue here, I'll turn the volume up just for a sec. There's a head move that directs your attention back across the table, kind of guides you over to look because it's his turn next. Yes. Let us discuss recently the we've been posting on our right here. YouTube playlist. David, I got it. So as he looks across the table, the attention now shifts over here. So you got to think of it as kind of like a ping pong match, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. See super mellow over here, just kind of a moving hold. Now focuses here. See so he's doing almost nothing. Big move here, nothing happening here. It's literally just back and forth, back and forth. Now this was a short sequence I did years ago, and it was uh, a dream sequence in a sh in a live action short. So you can watch it and you get a feel for what's going on. Okay, so you can kind of get a feel for this. It's it's bright, it's way over the top, and it, it feels like a dream sequence. The, the action's big, the camera moves are big. Right here is a huge anticipation here, and the camera kind of slowly pulls you in, and then boom, gone. And then this, this camera move here, just kind of focus, and then just boom, just to give you the full scope. I think if if the shots were backwards, if it started wide... I don't think it's as effective as if you you're kind of follow. You don't know what she's jumped into, and then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, she's crazy. And then this one was just like just you know like motion ride, just right in your face, falling down a side of a cliff. And this was just the unnecessary anime lens flare with the streaks because it was supposed to be funny and over the top. Boom. Yeah, so these are just five shots out of, uh, I think it was a 15-shot sequence. But you get the idea. It's way over the top. And camera moves that match the subject matter. The snowboard she's riding is actually on the share site if you want to go grab it. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at is Pumpkinhead because there was a lot of really cool opportunities for some nice staging in this project. So uh, I'll just kind of babble over it but in this first shot here we know something bad is happening I think the camera move reflects the mood of the scene it's slow the posing isn't big it's just it's it's building up to something the camera's coming into the event his arm is raising up uh, there's a white reflector on the ceiling kind of behind the knife that makes the knife kind of glint and pick up. So you've got a big bright spot on a dark background. It's kind of guiding your attention to that. And the camera move is timed with the anticipation of this and then boom. And right when it hits here, there's a frame of white. 
I actually learned that from the Braveheart DVD. Mel Gibson talks about how he puts frames of white in his movies to make the hits hurt more. That works pretty good. Ouch. So this one, he's just doing his hack job, but the camera's doing this weird kind of off-kilter, off-balance kind of pivot to kind of match what's happening. And then that just cuts out to a wide, you're kind of like the silent observer. This is another one where you're off-kilter kind of, you know, where things are kind of just twisting. So when you're talking about staging, they mention posing, camera, and lighting. Uh, this scene would not be as effective if it was happening at 3 o'clock in the afternoon with a sunbeam coming through the window. All these things tie together to make this series of shots as off-putting as they are. Again, this shot here, the camera's kind of like a handheld feel. This pose here, where it releases, it took a lot of time to get that reflection over his shoulder showing up in the mirror the way that it does and dropping this piece of fleshy stuff so that it so that you can read it as it falls so that it doesn't just disappear behind him there's another white boom so this one this camera move is like the first one it's a slow build up it's like you're seeing something happen and you can't stop it you know like if you're about to witness an accident you feel like it's in slow motion it's like you know what he's going to do and you just hope it's not going to happen it kind of the camera kind of comes in slow and it's like ah oh god okay ah oh, that's great okay and then this one now you start to get into like the rapid fire stuff and if you watch it this camera move is a direct result of what's happening in this scene it's the only shot that has one of those jj abrams punch-ins that just makes it feel more like in your face it's the most violent action in the whole short, and it's the most violent camera move as well. Now this one, this camera move is just kind of very soft and floaty because he's exhausted. Nothing's happening. He's just, he's done. He's been stabbing his face for 20 minutes, and now he's just done. That's just knife, some camera angle. Now the camera here is just kind of locked off, but everything's happening in the mirror. We got big bright eyes on a big black background. All of the focus is in the mirror. I could have filmed this a different way. It could have been from the mirror's point of view, like looking out, but I didn't think it's as effective. I like the depth of this. I like that he's staring at himself. It has a weird creepiness to it. Um, this right here, this framing of his face through the arm, this that's not by accident. It took a lot of kind of looking through the preview window to get these reflections to line up so they weren't getting cropped out. And there we go. And I'm staging again, his face full frame, big yellow eyes on pretty much black. So there you go. Okay, so that's it for this week. Hopefully that uh, sheds some light on staging, why it's important and how you can kind of use it to your advantage to help shape the emotions of your scenes. Um, I'm not a director. I'm not a cinematographer. There are way more talented people out there that uh, talk about stuff like film composition and film language. Um, and I suggest you go and maybe read some books and watch some YouTube videos. There are two books I can recommend. Uh, I've read both and they're both really good. Uh, one is called Film Directing Shot by Shot. And uh, I think all animators have this. I see this book on a lot of desks at work. And another one that's really good is called uh, In the Blink of an Eye by Walter Murch. And uh, he's edited some things. You know, Apocalypse Now, Godfather 2, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, both books are amazing. And, uh, and if you want to learn a little bit more about just composing shots, I would give them both a whirl. All right, we'll see you next week.